Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our first inaugural, hopefully annual, alumni panel on navigating the world from a first-generation lens. I'll begin first with introducing myself, allow my esteemed panelists to introduce themselves, but before that, talk about what we'll cover during this session. Um, so my name is Katie Fong. I go by she, her, her pronouns. I serve as a senior assistant director of admissions and coordinator of multicultural recruitment at Bryant University. Um, and again, today is a special day, November 8th. Specifically, we'll talk about the significance behind that and its relation to uh, the first generation identity. But going into a little bit of what we'll cover in this session, again, we'll talk about the significance of why this day, um, it happened to work out that we were able to do the kickoff to our um, inaugural first generation celebration week today. We'll talk about some of the events that um, as students you can participate in throughout the week. Uh, we're definitely excited, I know, on our call. Um, today we have Jordan Cruz uh, who serves um, in the Center for Diversity and Inclusion in the Intercultural Center and Becca Senna from Academic Advising also on here too. So you'll see their faces, whether you join us in person or virtually for some of the sessions. Again, we'll pass it over to our panelists to introduce themselves, share a little bit about who they are. Uh, we did have their bio and some of that information um, through Engage. So if you were checking some of that out, you may already know uh, we may already know them from some experience, depending if you were maybe exposed to getting to know them in clubs and organizations while they were a student, as mentors, um, or sometimes just looking around Bryant. I know they are all familiar faces. And then we'll wrap up with a question and answer, some of which I will allow for open forum after we go through the formal portion. A little bit on the significance of today. I don't know if this would be new to you all. I know when I was first uh, researching and taking a look at some of this, this was actually new to me, something I found out a few years ago. So actually November 8th um, dates back or goes back to the anniversary of National First Generation College Celebration and even more of a historical context. Um, it's when President Johnson signed the Higher Education Act of 1965, really to enact and push forward the, the ability to recognize the first generation student identity, what that means, defining it, also speaking to successes and putting government dollars towards supporting things such as TRIO programs, financial aid funding, and looking for better ways to support them. So that may be a fun fact for you, something new that you learned and take away from this, um, but something that was new to me as recent as a few years ago. As far as defining first generation, I know sometimes even as a first generation to college student, that identity is maybe something you don't even find out until you're already in that college experience or you're looking for where it is that you will attend college and then maybe talking to your guidance counselor, that's how you find out. Or um, like I said, for some students, it's not until they're in college that they really come to define, oh, that's what you name um, that identity. So a definition and, and different universities use different ways to define what that means for them. But at Bryant University, our, uh, our identity or the definition for that identity is a student whose parent or legal guardians um, have not obtained a bachelor's degree, which means that student is the first to obtain a four-year college or university degree. Um, and that for us counts um, not non-US or in the US for some colleges and universities, they define that differently. So hopefully that sets a little bit of context as far as how we define that identity at Bryant. And moving forward a little bit more, this is something that Becca did express um, her excitement for all of us, um, both um, Becca, Jordan, as well as um, Kristen, who is not on this call, but also serves um, as a program coordinator for the Center for Student Leadership and Involvement, as well as in the capacity with the CDI, um, helped in the planning of all of this. So as you can see, today's our kickoff. We're starting off with a panel on um, navigating that process as a first generation student in that lens, um, really then going into our infamous bingo. I don't think that you can really do Bryant Wright or kick off something um, without a, a bingo night. So join us for that. Um, we also know, and we'll kind of cover this in some of our questions, 
that tie between this identity and the understanding um, or of financial literacy and the importance of that. So we wanted to make sure that there's both a virtual and in-person session for this um, with a financial aid counselor to understand what is the difference between say subsidized to unsubsidized loans or um, work study maybe you don't have one at this time where it is that you may find that or where that list exists or even beyond that where does the financial aid office exist at bryant university and then we bring in the aspects of food we always know that uh, when talking to college students you got to put the word free and food together um, so there'll be some uh, bubble tea and kind of really meeting with the community and others who identify with that first generation identity as faculty, students, and staff. Um, we'll have a conversation with counseling services uh, and talking about that um, not only the counseling services and what they offer, but potentially pieces about mental health and self care, especially in these times. Um, and then as it relates to that first generation identity. And then we'll round it out uh, with career prep and what that looks like. Some of you may be in that process right now looking for co-ops or internship opportunities or thinking about post-grad and what that may look like. So that um, in all is, is a pretty robust week that we have for you where fingers crossed hoping all goes well um, as this is our first time around with all of that. So with that there, I'm going to jump right into to introductions. I'll just, it's in alphabetical order. So as your picture comes up, feel free to unmute and share um, a little bit about who you are. I did put your class year on there as well as your major um, as, as far as uh, letting the panelists know that. But feel free to share other identities that you may have that are important to you and in, in your college experience and who you are and how you show up in the world today. Um, and anything else that you, you wish to share uh, as a quick snippet about your Bryant experience. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Tyler Brum. I graduated from Bryant in 2013, majored in marketing. Um, it's just funny looking at that picture of, of me. All right, I'll put you over here. A um, little bit about me. Okay, so he, him, um, pronouns. And while I was at Bryant, I, you know, some of my proudest moments, um, I was an RA, resident assistant, and then eventually uh, had resident assistant my senior year. And I feel like a lot of my friends, some of them on this call, uh, came from, you know, being RAs together. I was also a student worker uh, all four years at Bryant. And um, fun fact, I ended up working in the same office after I graduated, so it's like I never left and really created a work family there. Um, currently, uh, I am a marketing consultant for CVS Health, and I focus on their uh, digital screen strategy and expansion nationwide. So fun things there. Um, I'm excited to be on this call. Being first generation, both my parents came from the Azores, and I was the first to go to college and my family and get a degree. Um, super proud moment for me and excited to uh, be on this call today and learn from everyone else too. So thank you for having me. Hey everyone, I'm Shruti Kinsara, class of 2018. I go by she, her pronouns. And uh, as Tyler mentioned, I'm also really excited to, to be here today and learn a little bit more about my fellow alumni as well as provide any potential insight around the four wonderful years that, that I had at Bryant. So currently I live in Chicago, Illinois. I am a data and analytics consultant at a company called Solemn Consulting. Um, my family moved to the U.S. in 2004, and so I was the first person in my family to complete a four-year degree, um, and I'm very glad that I chose Bryant as the, the place to do it because I was granted wonderful experiences over the four years, including some of the on-campus that I had clubs and orgs that I was involved in, as well as some other things that I've been talking about in more detail uh, for the, the rest of the conversation. So once again, thanks for having me and looking forward to sharing some of my experiences with you all. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Kayla Navarro. Um, I think I can be safe to say that I'm the current baby of the alums here on my fellow panel. I am the class of 2019, so really not that long ago, even though it feels like forever now. Um, during my time at Bryant, I dual majored in international business and applied psychology. So I was able to obtain a Bachelor of Science and a Bachelor of Arts um, throughout my four years which um, is one of my biggest accomplishments, especially being a first gen. 
So um, a little bit more about my life after Bryant. I recently moved to Mansfield, Massachusetts, closer to my job of work, which I am currently an experienced tax associate at PwC, which is one of the big four accounting firms worldwide. So I'm currently dealing with a lot of pharmaceutical companies and a lot of international work as well, which ties into kind of my degree. Um, so I'm really enjoying that process so far. Currently trying to further up myself in the career and um, planning on going back to school as well. Um, thinking of looking into Brian as well for my master's. So never planning on leaving really. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to answering any questions you guys have and getting to know everybody as well and learning from my fellow panelists. Hello, everyone. My name is Sharday Penn. Um, I'm Brian. I was Sharday Hunchante. So you can see I'm a married woman. Um, again, I graduated in class of 2017 um, from Brian, and I majored in communications and minored in Africana Black Studies and Computer Information Systems. Um, shortly after graduating Brian, I started working in the alumni office with Tyler Brown, um, and I was there. I did a lot of computer stuff, and I worked on their website. I also did a lot of their donation campaigns and making sure that those things were running. Um, currently, I am self-employed and I'm doing my own business where I am managing websites and helping websites to be more accessible and secure. Um, so my business is called Sharday Works Tech. It's a baby, baby, baby business in its early stages. Um, and I'm currently doing some training with the University of Cornell um, to help make sure that my business is as strong as it should be. Now, more things about myself. I'm a mom, I'm a military spouse, and I'm living down in Virginia. Wonderful, 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 wonderful place to be living um, in the current climate. So that's me. <laughs> Perfect. So if you need any sort of website help or anything like that, sure, is your girl to go to. I will get her contact information, the name of her business, and send that along to you all. Um, but with that, we'll just jump into questions. I kind of broke it up in a couple of questions that were directed to prospective students and then really the heavy focus on our current student population and thinking about the experience as a first year student, potentially a senior who's looking for a postgraduate job, and then um, kind of a final note as far as any sort of advice that the panelists wish, wish to share. So on that piece, I'll start with our um, more recent grads. So we'll have Kayla and then Shruti, if you want to jump in in talking about um, some of these questions here. So in thinking about your, your journey to Bryant, um, I know that you just recently graduated and thinking about the college um, search process was four years before that, before your four years. Um, uh, and reflecting on your college search process, and thinking about that first generation student identity, how did you navigate that process? And then also furthermore, uh, what factors maybe led you to ultimately choosing Brian? So I'll start first with Kayla there, knowing that, like you said, you're the baby on the call here and that process may be a little bit more familiar to you remembering that. Yes, thank you, Katie. So definitely it's still fresh in my head, surprisingly, right after all this time. Um, but the search was quite stressful during that time period as a small little baby junior in high school for me. Um, I did a plethora of research along the way because I just felt like I had to basically compensate for all of, I was just trying to grab all that knowledge out there, right? So Google was my best friend during the time. Um, and on top of that too, besides doing my own research, I was in my guidance counselor's office in high school, probably nearly every week. I'm pretty sure he got tired of me. <laughs> um, but I was just so anxious about the process because I was, I felt like I was basically starting off from square zero. I didn't have my parents to go to to reflect on, hey, what was your experience like? What was your college application process like? Um, what did you write about in your college essay? You know, there's so many different factors that, and minor details that kind of go into completing your application and just feeling comfortable with the final decision too, because you need to figure out, okay, how many schools do I want to apply to? Is, is this too little? Is this too many? So it was a very strenuous process, but it was definitely worth the efforts. And to the point as well, where I was doing so much research, I was even helping friends that had, that weren't first generations um, with questions and tips and just advice that I had seen online. 
Um, but those were basically my, my process really going into it. I really sat down and was like, what's going to make me happy? What do I want to do? Thankfully, my parents were great in that effort where there was no pushing um, to a certain degree or area of field of study. It was all just very centered and they were like, just do what makes you happy. Find something that makes you comfortable. So that really brought in my horizons where I wasn't as limited, which was really nice as well. Um, and then factors that led me to choosing Bryant were plain, the first one being I wanted to be close to home. I've always been a big family person, so I did not want to be far away from my family and my parents. So I really tried to find schools that were based in the New England area. I am originally from North Providence, Rhode Island, so very close to Bryant, <laughs> so really didn't really go that far. Um, but I had applied to schools mostly in Rhode Island. I pretty much covered, I think, the basis in Rhode Island of schools to apply to. And then branched out a little bit to Massachusetts and like Northeastern, those types of schools. Um, but that was my big, big factor is that I wanted to be close to home. I wanted to not have an excuse to visit my family being a flight <laughs> um, or along those lines and not being able to actually get home. So that was a huge factor. And then another factor for me is that I'm a big person that believes in culture and bringing the world together through our cultures and in being able to understand one another in the best ways possible. So I knew that I wanted to center my career and what I wanted to study around some sort of international component. Um, going into it, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do languages at first because I do love learning languages. I love educating myself in that sense and being able to meet people worldwide through that. Um, furthermore, I also knew that I wanted to go more into a business spectrum rather than fully arts. So that's kind of what gravitated me towards, okay, so what can I do that's international, that's businessy, but without traveling across the globe? Because you hear international and the first thing is, oh, okay, I got to get on a flight. <laughs> I got to go to Europe to study. I got to do something there. But no, thankfully, I, through my research and through talking to my guidance counselor, he basically showed up this program at Bryant University. He's like, this is a really good school. It's really up and coming with their IB program. IB short for international business for those that may not know. And I was looking into the program. I even called the university a few times to discuss it with a few professors and a few other people because again, like I said, I was a little bit research heavy at this point in my time. I basically wanted all the details laid out for me. So I really just wanted to get everything I could there. And after speaking to people, I took a tour on campus as well, getting to see everybody, seeing the campus and how beautiful it was. It really just brought the whole picture together for me. And as cliche as it sounds, as soon as I stepped on campus during my first tour, I was like, this feels like home. And when I got to meet the professors, it further developed that feeling. So. Brian really just felt like the ultimate package for me at the time and I do not regret anything throughout my time at Brian it's really furthered me even more throughout my time so um, yeah so that's my experience and my way to Brian. <laughs> Excellent I saw a lot of head nodding and agreement from other panelists I was doing that myself so very much so agree with that. I'm gonna pass the next question over to Tyler and thinking about, um, you really answer that question, Kayla, in a very like robust way, but in thinking in reflection, um, Tyler, when thinking about your process, although maybe a little bit longer than, than Kayla's uh, process as far as um, when you were thinking about that color search, were there things that you wish you had known, you know, talking specifically to prospective students right now or resources that you found helpful that maybe you found out after the fact or from other friends who don't identify with the first generation but were continuing ed um, students. Are there any, is there any advice that you have along those lines? Sure, I mean, when I was looking at colleges, we're talking about 2007, 2008, but so a long time ago, um, but I'm sure the process hasn't changed that much. I was definitely overwhelmed by all of the college fairs and just walking into, um, you know, a gym and seeing 300 schools and not knowing what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go. I, I knew from just like my family background that I wanted to go into business. Um, so then I started researching business schools and it's so funny. I tell everyone this story. There was a, I'm from Fall River, Massachusetts, right? So there was a local um, college fair. I walked in, I was overwhelmed and I, I looked right, like I beelined it and I just saw Bryant University and out of the whole sea of colleges, it was the only school where both representatives 
I think we're current students. They're both in suits. Um, and it's it's weird to describe like this, but the table had like a nice our nice Bryant like tablecloth. There was a nice presentation, and I naturally just gravitated over there. And from that moment, um, you know, hearing the students' stories um, afterwards, and this is something that like I wish I knew. Just like you can connect with the admissions office, whether it's for more information and informal interview, um, connecting with current students there. That's definitely something that. I feel like can help you decide more than anything you can find on Google is to just hear the stories of current students there. Um, but honestly, from that one moment, I fell in love with Brian and then everything after that, you know, speaking with admissions, um, talking to current students there, I applied early decision. I didn't tour any other school. I didn't look at any other school. I and then I stepped foot on campus and my family's like, you sure you don't want to look at other schools? And the second I stepped foot on campus, I'm like, nope, this is my home. And it's true. I, I really don't regret that decision at all. Um, Bryant was an amazing, amazing four years. But my advice would be, you know, just try to talk to current students, especially those if you're interested in business, whatever your interests are, try to talk to someone who is pursuing that at that school now and get their real real life input as they're going through it versus you know reading reviews or or reading something online excellent thank you for that um, so hopefully that is helpful. Uh, I know that prospective students will be sharing this at a later date or a point in time. So hopefully that sets the scene as to how some of our panelists were able to make their decision. But we'll, we'll transition a bit to talk about the first generation identity itself. Um, and I'm going to toss this over to Chardet to answer it um, first, but really in understanding that um, there, I think there are two different points in understanding the first generation identity when you, first of all, maybe define or come to learn what that definition means, but also um, how you sit with that once you figure out the, what the first generation identity is. And oftentimes I know that I um, can align with some of this myself, but when thinking about that identity, are there times that you've always viewed this as asset based or really as a strength or are there times that you may have seen it as a deficit or imposter syndrome um, throughout your college experience and I know this is a challenging question but one that is very real for anyone that um, does come from a historically underrepresented background first generation to college student identity just being one of those um, and for, for those who may have never heard of imposter syndrome, I do put a definition over here on the side um, in case you've never heard of it before. Again, it was not until my college experience before I was able to name what that exactly is. So Sharday, if you don't mind taking that on and then I'm gonna have Kayla follow up with anything else that you want to add. Um, so I'm really excited to answer this question. Um, I am from Boston, Massachusetts, Dorchester. I'm a very proud Bostonian, um, but very much I'm very proud of where I'm from now. History about Dorchester, it's, it's a very poor area of Boston, one of the largest neighborhoods. So that adds some context. I didn't know I was first generation college student to be a, a student because, you know, all my friends, we all were at a college preparatory school, but none of our parents had gone to college. That's why we were at the charter school that we attended. Um, and then all my friends who were in Boston public schools, the same thing. We were all striving and working hard so that we could become that person um, who would go on into complete college because my parents did attempt, but you know, life happened. So I didn't know that um, I was in that category, I think until probably my second semester being at Bryant, where I really started to meet other students who were like third, fourth generation Bryant legacy kids where I really started to understand that there was a huge difference between um, my experience in entering the school and then also just being on a college campus with people who had a lot of confidence about being where they were because that information had been passed down to them for a while. So that kind of answers that question. I, have I always viewed this identity as an asset. I would say no, <laughs> because um, just not having access to information I don't see that ever as an advantage. Um, and that's kind of unfortunate, but so yeah, it's always been a deficit for me. And I definitely experienced some imposter syndrome. I would say just a little bit based off of, you know, I didn't know where to find resources. So I had to do a lot of networking to kind of get that information from my peers, whether it's talking about getting money for books 
or what classes I should take or, you know, I went to Bryant to be an entrepreneur and I ended up studying communication, kind of having more information about really aligning who you are with your goals for the future based off of what you should and aligning that with what you should study, I think would have provided me a lot more guidance, but because I was the first in my family to have made it that far into college, um, I didn't really have some of that confidence or some of that guidance that would um, have made me more, you know, better prepared to continue on through college. If that answers that question, I want to kind of keep it short to give Kayla an opportunity to share some of her perspective. Yeah, thank you, Sade. Um, I agree greatly with a lot of what Sade said. I think she made some great points. And I think that first generation students, um, and I don't want to speak for the full panel, but I'm sure all of us in some sort of way have experienced the things that Sade has mentioned. Um, I came to a realization about my first generation status a little bit earlier on, mostly because it was a big driving factor for my parents. Um, they made sure I was well aware of the fact that I had to, you know, keep working hard continuously and always to kind of, you know, make the family proud um, and get to a place that the family just hadn't gotten to yet. And I appreciate that, but it was definitely a lot of pressure at the time, especially being young, right? You're, there's so much already going on. Like Tyler said, it's so overwhelming at the time, plus this whole other pressure of making your family proud and making sure everybody is satisfied. It's a lot, but overall it's been, I, and I, I agree with Shardy. I, I think that at the time when I was going through the process of college and even high school, I was also first gen in high school. Um, you know, it was very much, I felt a little bit like I didn't belong a lot of the times, especially because my whole entire life, I've, I'm a Colombian American, so I've always gone to um, predominantly white institutions. So I already off the bat was already in the minority a lot of the time. So it was something else on top of that, right? And now looking back at my experience, I consider it an asset now because of the fact that I'm very proud of how far I've come being a first gen in multiple ways. And I think I can speak that for everybody here. You know, I'm sure we've, we've all surpassed what <laughs> any of us probably thought at the time that we would reach. And I think that's something so empowering. Um, even being here today, I'm being reminded of that. So um, it may seem like, a, like, you know, like, okay, you're a little bit behind, but trust me, someday you're gonna surpass even the people that were super prepared um, way ahead of time. And, it, and regardless, everybody has their own journey. So um, yeah, so I think that that's where I'm at with that one. All right, thank you. Um, and Shruti, I promise I did not forget about you. I have you in our lineup for some back-to-back -back questions, so get, get ready for those. Um, but the next one, uh, I'm going to talk about that concept of intersectionality. Again, a concept for me that I very much did not know until I got into the classroom, learned who Kimberly Crenshaw was, and um, a little bit of that through some of the mentors that I had on campus. So uh, I'm going to pass this back over to Tyler to talk a little bit about um, oftentimes intersectionality will first kind of define that or what I mean about that and then um, into the question that aligns with that. Oftentimes there is this um, alignment between the identity of being first generation but also coming from a low socioeconomic background. That is not always the case. That is not speaking as an umbrella statement or a monolith for everyone but that is um, oftentimes a tie that can be put together. So thinking about that and thinking about that Bryant University being a private institution, one that of course comes at the cost of a private institution, there are often challenges that can be aligned with the idea of affordability, well-being, you know, mental stresses sometimes that are, are tied with the financial pressures um, while obtaining that education. So with that in mind, um, for those who may identify with this, how did you navigate that challenge as a student or maybe even thinking about deciding on Brian itself? I know Brian, um, Tyler, you said that you went early decision, so that was a binding agreement there. Um, and then if, if and furthermore, um, what resources should students be aware of to alleviate some of the potential stresses that could come with this identity and that intersectionality um, of socioeconomic background? Yeah, no, honestly, great, great question, Katie. Um, I think for me, I had a very comfortable upbringing and childhood. Um, up until my 13th birthday, my, my father, who um, was the only one that worked in my family, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, my father passed away unexpectedly um, right after my 13th birthday. And I had to, my family had to quickly go from, you know, just 
being fine and okay to, all right, how are we going to carry on? Because he did everything. Um, and it was a real shock for, for all of us for a while. Um, but, you know, as the son of the family, I definitely like wanted to step up and you know prove that i could i could be there for my mom and my sister so i started working and hustling at and a very you know right right um then even before you could actually legally work you know just asking hey who needs their um lawn cut can i um, shovel snow and then like chores and then once i could actually you know be an employee and work um, I got to work with my sister and get an office job. And I really learned the value of the dollar um, really quick because my life changed completely. And when looking at colleges, um, for a long time in high school, I thought I would go to my local community, community college, like my friends, because it was affordable. I would get my education and I would stay in Fall River. Um, and it wasn't until I started, you know, talking to my guidance counselor at my high school, and she really motivated me saying, you know, you're a bright student, you're a go-getter, you know, you just put yourself out there and look. And that's when I started considering, uh, considering private institutions. I will say my biggest piece of advice, especially, especially those who um, might struggle financially, would be, you know, scholarships, 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 grants. I mean, apply for everything, um, and I did. Anything that I met the criteria for, um, whether it was academic or background, I went for it. And a lot of those I didn't get, and it was okay. Um, but I got enough to, you know, feel comfortable to apply to a private institution like like Brian. And once I saw my financial aid package with Brian, and I sat down with my family, it really was a tough conversation about, I really want to go here, mom, but I don't know if we can afford this. And um, it was it was tough because you know how do you tell your son hey i i can't pay for your private college education um but you know i want you to have the best education so she did she took out a parent loan i took out a loan and with the scholarships and the grants that um, brian had and i received through high school i was able to attend now for me a big part once i was at bryant was you know how do i keep paying down that loan becoming a resident assistant was a great experience for me but it was also a big help too um with what that covered but i would say you know it's it's tough because you love a college you fall in love with it and everything and then you see the bottom line and it's like oh okay this is this might be difficult and you know student loans right now i mean just look at the nation's debt more, practically everyone has student loan debt right now. Don't let that deter you from getting an education that you deserve. And that's my biggest piece of advice because I didn't think I was worthy enough to get an education like one at Bryant. And it wasn't until I just jumped right into it. Um, and I'm so happy that I did. I, I, I really am because the experience, you know, I, I would never take that experience back. All right, and Charday, um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, um, to this question here. Yeah, I'd love to add, um, I'd love to answer that part about how did I navigate it. So similar to Tyler, my mom took out a Parent PLUS loan. I took out as many federal loans that I could and made sure to stay away from private loans. Um, and then I made sure, you know, I had access to work study. So I worked almost every single year, every semester that I could at Bryant to help pay for the things that weren't covered by um, my financial aid. So to pay for food, to pay for a little bit of books on the side, um, I made sure to take advantage of that resource. Um, and then on top of that, I did become an RA. I like fought so hard to make sure that I was even qualified to be able to do it and to make sure I stayed one. So I was an RA all three years um, at Bryan as well. And that, as he said, takes a lot of weight off of, you know, the cost of higher education. Now, when I decided to go to Bryan, I knew that it was expensive. Um, it was the most expensive school that I applied to, but I knew that Bryant would have access to resources that some of those other colleges weren't going to be able to have. So I took that cost analysis and I said I might as well just go with it. Um, resources that students should be able to know that be aware of. Financial aid, you might hear no a few times. That was my experience. I heard no a few times but I kept pushing, 
right? And I explained my situation over and over. And eventually there was a little bit of wiggle room for money so that I could um, no longer have to pay for books. I don't know if that program still exists, but there used to be a book program where you'd receive some kind of stipend to pay for all of the books that you'd need for each semester. Um, now, I think with the ICC endowment fund, for students who receive benefits from there, I believe that they will be able to have some costs um, paid for through that program, but I don't know too much about it at the moment. Um, but yeah, I don't recommend for students to like work, 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 work for a job so that they could be able to pay for school because that takes away from your ability to study. Um, and the whole reason why you are in college is to make sure that you're able to graduate with as high as a GPA as you can for your job prospects. Now, I will admit to everyone, you know, because I worked so much, my grades took a big hit. And that's something I will always remember. I would never want to be in a situation where I have to work so hard to be able to pay for my education. And then I'm not able to really get the education or get the most out of it that I can. Um, so for prospective students, if you're looking at schools, Bryant, you might have the best package available. Um, but if there's some way for you to also get aid so it doesn't take away from your ability to really focus on class, I would suggest you take whatever route that looks like for you. Um, because that's my biggest regret, not really focusing as much as, um, on my education as I could have been because I was working so hard to pay for the education. <laughs> So yeah. Excellent. And we definitely want to make sure, um, I know from the admissions point of view, we always say we want that uh, person to be a community member. And that does not just mean going to the classroom and back to their residence hall, or like you said, going to class and then maybe um, doing a work study position. And that's all knowing that there's that student life piece um, beyond that piece too, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but we're going to hear a, a little bit now from um, Shruti and, and talking about campus resources and thinking about some of that maybe tied into that piece that we just talked about with intersectionality, affordability. Um, but when thinking about this, what are some campus resources, programs, or people? Um, I'm sure that there are mentors that you can name that still work at Bryant. It's a place where um, I know there are some people on this panel here who, after their, their college experience at Bryant, or like myself, returned back to the university. So in thinking about campus resources, what are some that you can name that may be helpful to students, especially in their first year, whether it be a prospective student that is listening to this panel later on, or someone in their first year who's thinking about this later on um, if Shruti if you want to add some context to that. As I was saying earlier this is a great segue from the piece on uh, intersectionality because one of the very first things that I uh, that I did when I was on campus was I attended the formal program which is specifically for multicultural and international students and so um, I was coming to Bryant from the Midwest. So I had never really been to New England before. I had been there for a weekend trip once a few years back. I'd never stepped foot in Rhode Island, had never been on campus, didn't really know anything about where I was headed. And um, on top of that, I was still also navigating kind of that similar socioeconomic background issue as well. Um, and so coming into campus and kind of getting a head start was, was really great because members of the program got to move in a few days early, got to establish connections with other people on campus much more easily. And it was a, a nice smaller group that took some of the, the pressure off and enabled me to feel like I could be myself a little bit more and, and wouldn't have to put up so much of a kind of persona of what it was that I was expected to maybe feel like when, when I was on campus. And so the formal program which was put on by the Center for Diversity and Inclusion was, was really essential and it also connected me to the center, which was extremely impactful for the rest of the four years that, that I was at Bryant. So I was really happy to have that introduction to that institution, to the people that worked there, um, enabled me to find some really great mentors and friends as a, as a result of that. Um, and so that definitely eased the transition and really made things a lot easier for me. I was also really lucky to have great RAs when I was a first year student who really focused on making sure that students felt like they had the opportunities that they wanted available to them. And so when I first came in, I didn't really have people from my high school that were attending Bryant. And it was all about trying to navigate and find people when um, so many people who were coming to Bryant from Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, already knew people that were at the, the university. And so I was really lucky to 
just be able to find some groups and organizations to, to fit into. So on that, finding clubs and organizations was also a, a really big part of what helped ease that transition. Um, when I came into my first semester, I was a little bit nervous about academics. And so the first semester, I didn't really get involved in anything. And I said, you know, I want to focus on my grades and I want to make sure that I'm doing well in school before I try and get involved in, in clubs and extracurriculars and anything like that. And knowing the difference of experience between my first and second semester, the second semester when I actually got involved in things, it was night and day. And I felt so much happier. I felt so much more a part of the community. And I think that actually helped me do better in my academics because now I had friends and connections that were in classes and I was able to form study groups and, and do things with other people. So because Bryant is such a community, anything that you can do to network and get connected to as many people as possible, I think is a, a great way to really help make the place feel like home. And I think it, it translates into success in a lot of different areas since you're already there. I think you already answered a little bit um, to the next part of this. Um, but as you think about going back, are there certain offices or areas of campus that you wish you had sought out a little bit earlier? I know you touched a little bit on student life, maybe um, maybe starting there a little bit earlier, but are there other areas that going back you would um, get involved in? I think from an academic perspective, I wish I had leveraged my professors a little bit more early on. Um, I think coming from high school, I was very much in the mindset of you know college professors are kind of these these big scary people and they won't care about you the same way that your high school teachers cared about you so don't bother them if, if you don't absolutely need to and once i was there for a few more years i realized especially at bryant how sociable and, and involved the professors are and how deeply invested they really can be in your success in and outside the classroom. And so I really wish that I'd, I'd taken some time earlier to build those connections with professors and seek out help when I needed it. Excellent. So now that you spoke about professors and everything like that, I think that's a great transition into a bit about the academics. And um, I'm going to have Sharde start here. Um, I know that very briefly in, in her introduction, she spoke about um, going or, or wanting to start out in entrepreneurship, ended up majoring in communication. Um, and there are definitely students, I always say during the admission process, 20% of students come in undecided. That is also a quote unquote major that sometimes um, prospective students forget or they're worried about that they need to know at that age of 16, 17 or 18. I think there are times that even us on the panel, um, that question of what do you want to be when you grow up, we're still answering that too. So Sharday, in thinking about your process in getting um, to that communication major or walking through students how to decide on that, um, what did that look like for yourself? And um, maybe tying that into how that first generation identity may have challenged you a bit academically or maybe just thinking about um, that change or transition of major. Awesome. So yes, I um, came to Bryant, had, at orientation wrote down I wanted to study entrepreneurship. Um, now in high school, I did an entrepreneurship program where I ran my own business for the last two years of my high school education. So I thought, well, why not? Bryant is a business school. I might as well try to get to some money and learn how to further develop myself as an entrepreneur. Um, and then I actually learned what being a business student looks like. And I realized I don't like accounting. I'm not good at it. I finance. It's not me. I'm more of a people person. I have a, I love personality. Um, and so I started, I, I met with my academic advisor and I really built a really strong connection with her at the time. And we kind of went over, you know, things that I like to do, what I really find a lot of interest in. Knowing that Bryant had that history of, an, um, of a business school, they have a really strong business program and a really strong um, social, not, what's the word? You guys know what I'm talking about, your college students are about to be. Um, but yeah, so it, they have two strong academic programs and which one really played out for me. So we went over that and she told me about the MyPath program. I think it's still happening, hopefully it is. I went through that my first semester. I met with, you know, different students who were studying entrepreneurship, communication, all the other social sciences. And I really found that being able to study people and how they communicate and how they interact with each other in the world 
was my calling at the time. Um, and that was the easiest way personally for me to get out of taking the core business classes <laughs> that I dreaded so much. Um, so yeah, that's how I landed on communication. And once, once I dove, dove into that academic side of it, I really fell in love and couldn't have imagined myself studying anything else um, primarily at Bryant. So yeah, I only took, did one major. I had the opportunity because I studied communication to have flexibility in my minors. So I chose um, Africana Black Studies. You guys see I'm a Black woman. If you're listening, I'm a Black woman from Boston, Massachusetts. And I went to a Black high school. My neighborhood was Black. And so I was in this predominantly white environment with people who told me they'd never seen someone who looked like me, who just had hair like me, who spoke like I did. Um, so I really wanted to like reaffirm my background. And so I studied Africana Black Studies. And, you know, I had to study something in the business field. So I landed on computer information systems because that was the minor that got me out of taking finance, <laughs> which I dreaded taking. Um, and I also had an interest and a, a knack for those kinds of things. Um, and so that's how I landed on computer information systems. It kind of was a, a, a grab bag at the time when I was choosing them, but you know, they all ended up working out for me. Just to jump in real quick before the next question, I'm so, my heart is so warm to hear that Sade had a good experience with advising in the MyPath program. The MyPath program is still alive and well. Um, it's a collaboration between academic affairs and student affairs, and it really does what she had mentioned, which is um, it gets you exposed to the different combinations of majors and minors um, and degree programs. So I'm so glad to hear that it was beneficial to you. It's still uh, strong and prevalent on campus. So definitely a, a resource that students should take advantage of because it is that unique partnership um, from both sides of the house. Oh yeah, thank you, Rebecca. My path program changed my path at Bryant. Like literally, I probably would have transferred from the school had I not found that I wanted to study communication. I would have been out of it. <laughs> That's incredible because a lot of students, and, and Katie is correct, we kind of say in advising that all students are exploratory. So even if you come in with BSBA accounting or you know uh, BS in actuarial math, um, that all students are exploratory because we have so much to offer and the combinations are, are literally endless. And so we have that unique program and um, all academic advisors are trained to uh, advise across all programs so that you can talk to your advisor and figure out what the best combination is for you. So that warms my heart so much. That's so great to hear. And can I also add that just reminded me, I was undecided from September of 2013 until September of 2014 for an entire year. And I just took my other core classes to make, like to get me through mm -hmm. before I actually declared. An, it's, it's okay. It really is okay. For a lot of things, you have the opportunity to change, even for like the hard majors like IB. There's still a way for you to slide in there. You just need to meet with your academic advisor and it'll happen for you. It always works out. Always. It always works out. That's awesome. Excellent. I love to hear all of that. And if you need any help and you decide to join us as a prospective student and then current student, um, Becca is your person. You already have a resource here who is uh, able and willing to help with that. Um, and then I don't know if Tyler, you had anything else you wanted to add on or touch on, or you feel that was all encompassing and it was already covering um, a lot from the academic lens. Yeah, no, I think Sade did a, a great job of describing it. Um, I would just say, you know, just follow what you're passionate about versus what people want you to do. I was finance, I was a finance major for I think two and a half years um, because my sister is a CFO and I did like finance people in the family and everyone's successful. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do finance. And then I realized for me personally, I think I'd be miserable for the rest of my life if I had to <laughs> do that. Um, so I switched to marketing and I got into public um, public relations with it and communications. It, I mean, it, it really just like jump started a path. So, you know, you might go in with one idea, you might come out with another, you might leave college with one degree and then realize you want to pursue something else entirely different. I have friends who received uh, marketing degrees from Brian and then are in a completely different field. And that's okay because a lot of the, you know, you know, fundamental things and the foundations that you learn, you can apply to any role, any job. Even my 
you know, two, two and a half years learning finance. Like that's fundamentals of business. And I still use it in my marketing role today. Um, but yeah, I would just say like, just, just follow what your heart tells you versus what people tell you to do. Cause that's, what's going to matter 10, 20 years down the road. Excellent. And I am aware that we are, believe it or not, rounding to the end of time, but um, I do have a, a handful more questions. So feel free to um, stay on or leave as you need to. And, and that goes definitely for our panelists um, if you are kind of hard set to the hour. But if not, I'll kind of keep pushing through, see who stays on with me. Um, and then of course, like I said, we'll share, share this out for anyone that was not able to join us. Um, talking to more of the fun side or quote unquote fun side, as people would say, with the student life piece, I'm going to have um, Kayla jump in here and talking about what areas of campus you were able to get involved in um, and seeking leadership roles, how were you were able to come around to that, um, and then I'll, I'll pass it on to others from there. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. So this was probably where I had, and as Katie put it so so perfectly, is that this is where I had my most fun on campus. So I could, there's so many things I got involved in at Bryant. It was almost to the point of being ridiculous where my schedule was packed to the brim, but it, I was doing everything that I honestly loved. Um, like I said, I love getting to meet people. I love experiencing different cultures and different individuals as a whole. So I really made that a big point throughout my time at Bryant was to really get myself involved in not just one kind of niche group of people. I really tried to get myself spread across the board so I could really get as many opinions as I could. Just kind of rounding some off that come up to the top of my head. <laughs> I was involved in the Multicultural Student Union on campus. I had a work-study job at ACE, also known as the Academic Center of Excellence, which um, is also the tutoring center on our campus. I was involved in a dance team on campus called Advanced. I was um, a MyPath mentor. I was, <laughs> like I said, I can list them off. Um, but I really thought that, and I was also in Greek life on campus as well. I was a part of um, Alpha Omicron Pi, known as AO Pi as well. So I, like I said, I, I really got myself out there. And really one of the driving also reasons as to why I chose to pack my schedule so much. Other people might be like, well, she's crazy. She like, where did she find the time? But I was also a off-campus student, so I did not live on campus. So I was a commuter, so meaning that I would obviously drive to campus. Like I said, I'm from Rhode Island, so sadly, due to economic reasons, I could not convince my parents to let me live on campus just because I genuinely, if I chose to do that, I would not be able to afford the education there. So I really had to step out of my comfort zone and push myself even further to get myself kind of known across campus, right? Because I feel like when you are a commuter, it, that's already kind of, it can be a disadvantage, it cannot be, right? It just depends on how you choose to play and what's comfortable for you along the lines. I think getting involved in campus though is an amazing way to get yourself known, really put your name out there and make some decent and amazing friends that will last you a lifetime, you know, God willing. And I think that it's an amazing way to expand yourself. You really can push yourself and see who you can really become because of the fact that you're involved with so many different people and you can be in leadership roles in the clubs as well. You don't need to be an RA or a tour guide or, you know, those like really high up or like, you know, you don't need to be an OL to get your name known and to feel like you are a leader on campus. These clubs really do make a difference at the end of the day. And talking about giving some advice, you know, for students that might need to be seeking leadership roles on campus, like I said, get involved, honestly, just start from, you know, like Tyler said, start with what you like. There's literally so many clubs on campus, and I'm sure that since the time we've all graduated, there's probably like 25 to 30 more, you know, so just really, you know, look, go to the, go to the fairs, you know, look around, talk to people, really just set your heart out there, see what you like. If you like photography, go check to see if there's a photography club. Club. If you like to dance, join a dance team. Try out, you know, especially because we have a dance team at Brian, which is competitive, and then, you know, you have club dance teams, too. So you don't really need to worry all the time that you're, that you're going to compete, you know. It could really just be for the fun of it and just enjoying yourself. And I think that that really, you know, can freshen up your day as a student, you know, because we're so busy with these studies all the time. So clubs can really serve as that, you know, nice breath for the day. <laughs> so um, yeah, and I think, like I said, just try to get yourself out there. It really does make a difference. 
Excellent. And I'm going to have Shruti round that out, knowing that um, when taking a look at the plethora of things you were involved in, many of those were in the more formal leadership roles. If you wanted to speak to either the processes, the advice as students are thinking about those roles, um, or sometimes having that imposter syndrome, which may hold them back from thinking about themselves as a resident assistant orientation leader, um, or maybe that honor society um, Omicron Delta Kappa that as like a a future goal. Now what what's some advice you would lend there? I think one thing that that it's really easy to kind of tell yourself when you feel like you're in a minority in any situation is that because the people around you don't look like you, they might not agree with you or or value your opinions or you know there's not really a place for you somewhere and I think the most important piece of advice that I can share in regard to uh, seeking leadership roles on campus or, or anywhere else is that you bring a unique perspective to wherever it is you go. And if it's, you know, your first generation identity, it's your socioeconomic background, anything that that is a part of who you are, you are bringing that to the table and you should always feel empowered to, to do that and to, especially in situations where you feel like you are, are different from everybody else feel confident in in bringing that to the table because the entire group will benefit from whatever it is that, that you have to share and from your experiences and from the insights that you can provide. And so while that's easier said than done, and, and I know it can be really scary to leap into a situation, especially when, you know, you have to apply for something and you're worried that you might get rejected or that you might not be qualified enough for the position. I think what's really wonderful about Bryant is that there is an atmosphere of taking risks and of, you know, learning to fail forward. And this is the place where, where you can do that and you can sharpen your skills uh, in this kind of putting yourself out there skill set. And so pursue whatever it is that you want to do courageously and don't be afraid that you're going to be held back by by the experiences or the disadvantages that you feel you may have because you will probably be surprised by the number of doors that are open to you as long as you knock on them and uh, there are going to be wonderful people along the way who who will help you out. And don't unmute just yet. And that is a great transition. And as we wrap out and uh, wrap up and talking about the workplace and, and what that piece looks like. Um, so I'm going to have you share with us um, when, when thinking about things that students can possibly do or maybe things you did themselves to prepare themselves for the inter for internships or the workforce or what are some unconventional or conventional ways that you uh, may have prepared yourself for where you're at now. Yeah, great question. So part of the, the territory for me of being first gen and also of being an immigrant was that I didn't feel like my family had the connections to enable me to, to break into the industries that I was interested in pursuing. And so, um, you know, my parents have worked all kinds of different jobs to, to really provide a, a good life for our family, but they're not necessarily the kind of jobs that I was hoping for um, as a result of my international business degree and my um, information systems education as well. And so I wanted to go into something that was a little bit more technical, that had a, a broader reach. And I was very nervous because I wasn't sure just how to get my foot into, into these doors. And I knew speaking with my classmates, a lot of people had, you know, their parents, companies or connections through aunts and uncles and, and things like that. Um, so I had to be really intentional with my networking and figure out where I could build connections off of what I knew. And Bryant was the, the number one place to start. So when I was in my senior year and I was looking around for, for jobs to apply to, um, I, I went to the Amica Center for Career Education and a piece of advice that they gave to me was, you know, if there are companies that you're looking at that you're interested in, find out which Bryant alumni work there because Yes, I may not have had family connections, but now here I was connected to an extensive network of alumni simply because I had attended Bryant University. And so the job that I have right now, which is the, the job that I got after I graduated, um, I actually received because I had looked up companies in Chicago where I, where I was interested in working. I found a couple positions in the, the field that I, I liked, and I found there were a few Bryant alumni that were working at the company. I reached out to the one that looked the friendliest from LinkedIn Photos, and uh, we, we had a really great conversation. He actually got on the phone with me a few hours after I had originally messaged him. Um, and he, he gave me uh, more of an informational interview, talked about you know his role, the company, his experience, and 
forwarded all of my information out to the, the recruiter in the Chicago office. And so when I was going through the actual interviews, I found out that there were, at the time that I had my first interview, 11,000 applicants for the position. And having that person forward my information to the recruiter put me at the top of their pile because it was an in-company referral. And without that, I don't know if I would have even gotten anywhere close to, to where I am now. And so always find ways to, to take advantage of the, the connections that you have built, whether it's Bryant specifically or the clubs and orgs. For example, if you get involved in Greek life, there's great networking opportunities to, to leverage that. Or even just knowing that, that someone else is an RA, I feel like now that I'm in my career, when I meet people who work at places, but we have that kind of RA connection, that's also something that really helps uh, build friendships really quickly. So be intentional, be on the lookout, and, and take advantage of whatever it is that you that you have. I love that. Really unconventional, uh, the power of LinkedIn, the power of our 50,000 alumni strong that we always talk about, and using that, that idea of, of seeing which LinkedIn picture maybe looks the friendliest. So uh, I, I love to hear that, and maybe a, a piece of advice to note in the future for others. I'm going to have Tyler take lead on this next question in rounding out and thinking about um, not only advice that you can share with seniors as they enter in their first roles after Bryant, but potentially how um, your identity as first generation or other identities that you may share show up in the workplace. So whichever part of that question, but at the end of it all, really some advice that you'd share with those um, who may be seniors entering into the workforce soon. Sure. I mean, Shruti, I think you did an awesome job with everything you just said. And it's funny because I get a ton of current Brian students that reach out to me on LinkedIn. And I think it's because I have such like a welcoming personality. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's something that I had at Brian and, and after Brian. So after Brian, I, I worked in the alumni engagement office um, for five and a half years. And um, a portion of that time was with Charade in the office too. We were coworkers. But we really wanted to connect students with alumni. And it's, it's so important because alumni want to help out, right? Um, the, even if it's just a quick phone call like Trudy had um, and one email that's forwarded, that could change you know, that person's life. Um, and I, I, love, I love hearing stories about that. So for, for me, you know, my advice would be network like you, you know, like your life depends on it. Um, because like Trudy said, sometimes personally, we don't have the connections that other people have, right? But, you know, Brian is a great resource and tap into that alumni network, reach out to the, to the, to the alums at a company um, and just connect. And I, that's how I got a lot of, you know, my positions and, and my opportunities was, hey, can we grab a cup of coffee? Or, hey, do you have five minutes to chat? Um, I would say, you know, I get a lot of LinkedIn requests from students and whether they want to work at CVS or they just want to connect because of my background, um, I would say the more you can make your message personal, whether you're doing a, a LinkedIn connection with someone or you're applying for a job, you're um, writing a thank you note to the job recruiter or the hiring manager, make your, make your note, your email, your message um, personal, right? Instead of the generic, hi, I'd like to connect with you on LinkedIn, it means a lot to see, hey, Tyler, I am from the class of 2022, and you know, I really loved your experience at Bryant. Would love to chat about it. To me, I, I always accept those first and respond immediately to those because the more you can show that you thought about you know, what you were gonna say to the person, you thought about your message, and it wasn't just a generic thing. And this goes even to even talking about cover letters when applying for a job, just pulling out specific things about that role, specific things you're interested in. Um, that's, that's crucial to really, to really make um, a connection and an impression. And for me, I always say, you know, it's, it's difficult because Shruti said 11,000 people apply for that job, right? And it's, it's crazy how that happens. Um, but with my current role, I was nervous too, right? Fortune five company, I, I thought I would never get in. Um, but I, I said, all I need to do is get someone on the phone or someone in person. And as long as I can show everything, you know, 
every moment really builds up to, I think, these, these, these big moments with your final interview, your first interview. And you think about, I think about everything. It's almost like your life flashes before your eyes. As corny as that sounds, it, it really is. Um, but, you know, everything leads up to this moment. And a big part of that was that just work hard mentality that I have as, as a first gen. You know, knowing that I, 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 I'm not accustomed to a nine to five. For me, it's you work until the job gets done and you prove that, you know, you can do it and exceed and go above and beyond because I really do feel like we, we do have something to prove, right? You know, we, we do have to make a, a name for ourselves. And sometimes it's harder than most on um, being first gen. But that's probably a long winded answer for, for that. But I hope that was some good advice that students can take. Perfect. And Sharday, I'm going to have you round out the formal part of the presentation before we do leave, uh, leave off with that piece of advice for everyone. So everyone start thinking of your piece of advice. I think Tyler um, already gave his there, but Sharday, if you want to round us out here with any advice you would share with seniors as they think about their first role after Brian. I would advise for you to really figure out or start thinking about who you are, right, and how you want to show up in the workplace. And if that requires you to go back to your family and really like make some really good reconnections to where you're from, it'll really prepare you for the uninspected of just working with people who maybe aren't like you, right? And once you go from there, make sure that you're just constantly showing up as the true you because so are your coworkers. You can't, like, you're not gonna make the best connections by trying to be your coworker who has, you know, I'm not even gonna create some scenario, but you're never going to be successful by being someone else. So you really, 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 really make, need to make sure that you're going back to those, that truest version of yourself um, and rely on the education that you received at Bryant. You know it's great because we have a ton of successful people um, who have been able to really take advantage of that same education in their network. And then go back to those alumni, maybe who are working at your company as well, and talk to them and see how they're finding success. Um, more often than not, you're gonna find that other people were in your same shoes. They were first generation college students and they graduated and they got a job and now they're living, or they've always been living really successful and happy lives and you can do it too. Um, and just remember, again, you're not alone in it. No one is. Continue to show up as yourself and you, you'll make it, I promise. <laughs> Great. Um, I really love the authenticity and, and being genuine and being true to yourself. Um, and then I'm going to, like I said, round it out here with just a piece of advice. I think Tyler and Charday did a great job adding that piece of advice and thinking how to close this out. I'm going to let Kayla have an opportunity, Shruti, Becca, Jordan, anyone that wants to add, but starting first with Kayla for any piece of advice as you think about maybe the first generation identity, advice for seniors, or as a one last thing to leave with people that are watching this. Yeah, um, I think my biggest point is take every single identity that you have and just make sure you, you, you make it you. Um, I think that the strongest thing that I've done throughout my entire career, Brian and beyond, has been holding true and making it aware that I am proud of the identities that I hold. So when you ask me who I am, the first thing I say is I am a Colombian American woman working in a tax department, trying to become senior early. <laughs> so I make sure people know and I try and I hold that true to myself. I make people aware that, yes, I worked four years and I got two degrees. I worked hard. I think that don't back down from your successes. I think that first gens, for some odd reason, I find that we tend to do that a lot. We don't give ourselves enough credit as we should. <laughs> and I think that that's one of the, one of the hardest things on, on us in general is because we always want to be better. And I think that that's something that everybody should always strive to be is be better than the person you were yesterday. Don't try to be better than, as Sharday said, don't try to be better than your coworker. Don't try to be better than who this, who that. Always try to be better than yourself. Always work on improving who you are as an individual better and for, and that will take you much further throughout the day you'll become happier with yourself as an individual once you stop worrying about everybody else and another small little piece that I would say is as you make more connections throughout your lifetime 
don't forget about the connections you've already made. I think it's super important as well to hold the connections that you held during college and make sure you follow up on them. It doesn't have to be every single week, but just send somebody a message being like, hey, how are you? I was just checking in. I hope you're well. You know, just something along those lines. Make sure you hold those because you don't know later on in life, you could be where you were wanted to be at yesterday. And then tomorrow you're going to want to be somewhere else that maybe a, your professor from sophomore year could have taken you. So just make sure you also hold those dear or heart and then you keep up with those as well. Excellent. And Shruti, any final thoughts? Yeah, I'll just add quickly. Um, congrats on making it this far. And, you know, it's a, a testament to your hard work that, you know, you are um, thinking about all of these really kind of important questions about identity and about how to, to succeed over the next four years and, and onward. Um, I think one thing that's really important to keep in mind, uh, especially for, for current students, is, you know, Bryant is a great university, but the Bryant experience is the best thing that you can get out of, of attending this university. And so um, you've worked really hard to, to get to this point, and I'm sure academically you are really strong, but just remember to enjoy everything else that, that Bryant has to offer. Um, from a people perspective, from an opportunities perspective, there's, there's so much out there. And so uh, keep going and good job. <laughs> Excellent. So um, touched on those pieces there, but I do want to uh, say thank you to our panelists, first of all, couldn't have done it without you. Um, and I'm sure that if they feel comfortable by contacting me, if you have any unanswered questions, feel free to email me those. Um, and then I will get them to the right people. Or if not, going to look for their friendly picture on LinkedIn, that is a way to uh, get in, in touch with them too. Um, but like I said, thank you, whether you be joining this live through the broadcast or through the Zoom room, um, or if not watching this at a later date. But with any final closing thoughts, I welcome the panelists to say anything else they wish, or Becca, if you would like to close us out too. Um, and then if not, it will, we'll hang back for a couple more minutes. I don't want to take any more additional time on this nice 70 degree day. Uh, if folks want to go outdoors and um, continue the rest of their Sunday afternoon and evening, but we appreciate your time. But Becca, if you have anything to say. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to echo everybody's statements and I just wanted to echo you, Katie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I think there are so many students that are going to benefit from hearing from your perspective as a first gen student uh, myself. I wish I had some resources and, and utilize the resources that you had mentioned. Um, I will say this, nobody I've ever met in my professional and career, my personal life, there's not one person that made it through college without utilizing some support, whether it's a friend, a mentor, a resource on campus. Um, I know as first gen students, our gut reaction is to not ask for help because we fight that imposter syndrome of we, we shouldn't even be here, right? So I'm not going to bother anyone. I'm not going to ask for help, but utilizing your resources, that's what we're here for. So like Katie said, if there's anything I can do as an academic advisor, as a first gen student, as a human being that just supports people in their uh, college career, please don't hesitate to reach out. We will love to connect you with the resources that we have and get you, you know, involved. And we're so excited for the week ahead. Um, inaugural First Gen Week is something that Katie, Jordan, and Chris and I have been working on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And so we're so glad that it's coming to fruition. And uh, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't thank you enough.